I recently listened to a podcast where Mark Stavish was interviewed, and I thought it very interesting. He was talking about his book Egregores, which um, the occult entities that watch over human destiny. And I find it so interesting that I sent off for a copy, and I just finished reading it yesterday. Now, I haven't talked about egregores, and it's because of two reasons, really. One is I just have a sort of natural wariness about using jargon from the simple fact that I spend so much of my time having to write stuff for the IT industry, which is so heavy with jargon. I got a sort of natural revulsion to it. But more specifically, um, I'm, I tend not to use it in when I'm talking about magic and the occult. And it, there's a practical reason there. It's because the world of occult and magic is divided into many different schools, and some of them are quite antipathetic to each other. So, for instance, when I wanted to write my little book of demons, I knew that if I started immediately talking about uh, fairies, angels, um, devas, that sort of thing, some people would flip it open and say, oh, this is New Age stuff. And they might either buy it because it's New Age stuff and then be disappointed because it wasn't sufficiently New Age, or else they might not buy it simply because they thought it was New Age stuff and therefore not of interest. And similarly, if I'd talked about, you know, um, great ones beyond the circles of time, then someone might have said, well, this is Tophonian stuff, isn't it? Um, if I talked about thought forms and astral planes, oh, this is theosophy. So instead of doing any of those, what I did is I began by just talking about office equipment and the way it sometimes has an uncanny knack of just breaking down when you're most busy. And I said, people naturally say, how did it know we were in a deadline to break down? And they feel a bit embarrassed about that. You know, they say, oh, it's silly me to say that. But actually, I argue that it's not only a very natural thing in human psychology to say that, but actually it's a good question to ask and it's quite a useful way of approaching things. So, but um, having read this book, I realize it's, it, it's rather good terminology and it applies to one or two of the things I've talked about in, in recent um videos like this. So I thought I would uh, just introduce the idea of egregores and then look at one or two of my ideas in that context to see how it worked out. Now, it helps to have a diagram in this case. This is the earth, the surface of the earth. On it are people. Now, of course, the earth is fixed, it's rigid, apart from the odd earthquake and things like that. But the people are moving around all the time, but sort of moving around at this level. And I think there's an expression, the zoosphere or something, you know, um, or there might be uh, one more specific, the homosphere or something, for this sort of sphere of activity of people. And people communicate, they have ideas, they talk, um, and there are thoughts. And so we can sort of talk about a sphere beyond that. And people use the term noosphere. It's a sort of sphere of human awareness, activity, um, thoughts. In terms of um, uh, theosophy, you could say it's where thought forms hang out. Now, clearly, this is rigid. This moves around. But this is something much more flexible. You could imagine... Um, you know, during an eclipse of the moon, a lot of people looking up at the sky and thinking about the moon, it sort of might stretch up towards the moon, you know, it's, it's like a bubble, it moves around. Now, uh, there's an example of what can happen with this sort of concentration. My generation uh, was born mostly during the war, but we grew up with the after effects of war. I can remember Centres of towns demolished by, you know, had been demolished by bombs. Centre of Bristol was a bomb site. And we had food rationing and we had everyone talking about the horrors of the war. So naturally, my generation were pretty pacifist in nature. 
anti-war. And when they reach teenagehood, they tend to express that by spurning the sort of the military short back and sides look and growing long hair and wearing flowing clothes of tie-dye and that and beads and this, that, and the other. And talking about peace and love and um, great ideas like that. So what happened is um, it's sort of this stretched up. Imagine it, the bubble forming of peace, love, make love, not war, and all that. And of course, this was the hippie idea. And as it grew bigger, it attracted more people to it. And so you've got this great big sort of bubble of um, hippiedom uh, stretching the noosphere like that. And this is what one might call an egregore. It's something that was built up. Now, it's not just arbitrary because it has power. You see, each individual here might have been against war. And if they went into the street and say, I don't like war, <sighs> what would happen? But with the sort of like an inflated balloon with all the pressure in there, it's what could happen is all that energy could flow down and you get a huge march, a demonstration on the streets. Thousands of people with placards, anti-war. And um, you could say, in retrospect, it didn't have that much effect. But at the time, governments were frightened by it. Police and governments were scared. It was a powerful thing. So an egregore formed like that is a, can be quite a powerful thing. It both brings people together, it gets stronger, and then it's an energy that can flow down. That is the version of egregore that I grew up with because in the uh, f 50s and 60s, there wasn't a lot of alternative magical ideas around. And mostly in Britain, it was the books of W.E. Butler and Diane Fortune and Gareth Knight, people like that. And this was how they would describe an egregore. And in fact, um, there's a, this, it's quoted in this book here um, that... William Butler is quoted as saying, uh, I've got to find the thing. Yes, William Butler said, from an inner point of view, we may see it as a composite thought form charged with emotional energy. This energy is evoked from all those who are linked with a thought form. And if there are those in the group who know something of the psychic mechanism involved, it can be directed upon any chosen target. It's obvious such an energy could be used for good or evil purposes. The intention of those who manipulate the energy within the collective thought form determining the way it is directed. And another writer that I read around that time was Mauni Sadhu, who um, he says, Imagine that an intelligent and well-disposed man who is able to concentrate is thinking about a good idea, giving it a certain form. He may then find others who have same or similar ideas, and so a circle of men, and now we say women too, um, may come into being who are all thinking along the same lines but in a different form. It is as if every one of them is repeating the drawing of a plan, placing a pencil again and again on the same contours. The thing grows in strength, develops an astrosome, and becomes an egregor or collective entity. As I say, that was the idea of an egregore that I had in the, um, at that time. But I very soon learned that there is a different version of it too, which goes beyond this noosphere. If this is the sphere of sort of human thoughts and thinking, what would lie beyond? Well, that would be the spirit world. Out there is the spirit world. And um, the the question was uh, that, that egregores can exist out there in the spirit world even when people are not aware of them. And so you might have out here an egregore called the God of War. And, you know, it could take many forms, Mars, Ares, um, Thor, or whatever. But there's a, a war god out there. 
And the idea is that sometimes these gods come down to communicate with humans and they sort of like open up a channel. And then the same sort of thing as before happens that the people gather and they go up and they put their energy into that and it becomes stronger and stronger. So that is a, a different uh, view of an egregore. Now at this point, some people say, okay, which is the truth? Either our thoughts are all inside ourselves, in which case the noosphere is just a sort of concept, it isn't anything real, or else actual thought forms can be built up. And so the noosphere is, you know, full of these thought forms. Um, or is there a greater spirit world beyond um, where these um, egregores can be dwelling? Now, I've always argued that if you get stuck with that question, and you know, people say to me things like, you know, when you were doing the Abramelin operation, were you trying to bring something out of yourself, a sort of higher self, or were you calling on a thing that's out there? And the point was, I wasn't making that separation, that distinction. The thing is, if you're on a religious path, it's actually very important to feel that you are on the real path and not be led astray with a false path. And similarly, if you're doing scientific work, although you may be less confident that there is a truth that has been found, you don't want to be working with um, a theory that's been invalidated. You want to be working with the best theory around. And so it's important to know, say, ask these questions, you know, which is the truth, which is, what is it really? But for magic, I've always argued that it's much more important to ask what works, what feels right to me, what works for me, and to base your actions on that. Because otherwise, if you get stuck thinking, well, I won't start until I've decided what the truth is, you'll never get going. So that question, though it's a very interesting one, is not one that's going to occupy me at present. Because in fact, it's a good idea to hold several of these ideas at the same time. They work well together. An obvious historical example for me is um, the Nazi party. Now you see, on the one hand, there was Goebbels, who was um, Hitler's minister, minister of propaganda, deliberately building the egregore of the Nazi party. You know, choosing a logo, a very distinctive logo, the swastika in the white circle, and um, making sure it appeared everywhere, on banners, posters, everything like that. Gathering together literature, stories, and movies about the great history of Germany and the Germanic people, and how they had been cheated and crushed down, and how they must rise up again. Developing people in uh, smart uniforms for the SS, really impressive looking, and holding huge um, spectacles, marches, things like that. All these things built up an egregore of the Nazi party and made it very powerful. But I think there was another school as well. People like Himmler, who was more of an occultist. And I think his view was more that um, there were out there this great history of the Germanic people that has been forgotten and ignored, and that the ancient gods of Germany were now calling out to the downtrodden people of Germany, saying, rise up, discover your true self again. And um, that was his contribution to the Nazi party. And the two things coming together, I think, was a very powerful combination. Now, going back to my idea of the hippie thing, it was something new. There were no hippies before um, 1960, but it wasn't the first peace movement in the world. I mean, there have been peace movements ever since there have been war, probably. And uh, my parents met in an organization called the Kibbo Kift in the 1920s. And the Kibbo Kift um, 
believed that they believed in peace, they practiced free love, and they believed in returning to nature for inspiration. Not necessarily we should live in nature. They were quite pro-industry in that. But people needed to find their roots in nature, and so they would spend their weekends in tepees doing strange rituals dressed up in green clothes and things like that. Very much a proto-hippie thing. So that had been forgotten, you see, but like a bubble, that egregore, you could say, was still there, and it, like the way bubbles come together, it merged into the hippie movement. There was all that energy was already waiting out there. So which of these versions is true? You see, it works, it feels as though that energy is out there, either in the nerdsphere or beyond. You see, if I, um, one night, spent an hour gazing at the moon and meditating on it and everything, getting really into the feeling of moon, uh, sort of, you know, moon egregore, um, the next morning in bright sunshine, I can think about that and I don't have to do the whole hour of building it up again. It's almost as though I close my eyes and there I am back thinking about it. It's as if it's out there waiting to be picked up again. Um, and so it feels like that. So it makes sense to use that um, uh, that way of thinking when you're dealing with egregores, rather than saying, oh, actually, it must all be inside me. Now, I'm saying I, I, use this, I, I didn't use this terminology in the various videos I've done, but I'll give one to examples where it casts light on it. I think I was talking about Brexit and the way a slogan works and the difference between an argument and a slogan. And I said you can have very good arguments for or against leaving the EU. Um, but the problem with an argument is you can't just go on and on and on and on repeating it. Some arguments are complex and you need to, need to say them more than once to sink in. But once people have got an argument, if you keep repeating it, their mind shuts off, they don't like it. A slogan is different. If someone comes up with England for the English, now, that actually gains strength if you repeat it. If as a crowd start chanting, England for the English, England for the English, it comes stronger and stronger. So it's more like an invo uh, invocation of an egregore. And I said, what was being invoked? I pointed out that there was a problem here, you see, is that people planning to do that probably thought they were using a formula. And a formula is a simple thing, you know, you use it to get the result, then you switch it off. And I said, no, they're invoking a spirit. What I would now say is they were invoking egregore. And I said, it's a very lovely egregore. England for the English. You think of English country gardens, um, cricket matches on the village green, um, great history of archery and this, that and the other. A lot of very lovely things there. And so it's rather appealing, England for the English. But I pointed out that it's not a formula that you can just switch off. An egregore is rather like a living being. After all, it's got a spirit, it's got mind and it's got a body in terms of the people that are in that egregore. Um, so uh, as a living thing, it's much more complex as any living thing is. Take something as beautiful as a cat, lovely, furry, friendly cat. But if you treat it badly or neglect it, it can turn into a snarling, spiky monster. It could be angry. And I said that... Um, you know, it's all very well sort of invoking this great spirit of Englishness if you keep it positive. But if it gets attacked, it can turn very nasty because other characteristics of England, we can be incredibly arrogant, thinking we've got a right to rule the world. We can be very vicious in fighting. Um, we can be very snobbish. There are plenty of negative characteristics there which don't have to be manifest, but... If you just let the thing go and, and don't tend it, these negative characters can come out because it's like a living being. Behave If you behave badly to it, it'll behave badly to you.
And so, these people who thought they were just using a clever formula to win votes could find that they have got a real problem on their hands. They've evoked something very negative as well as positive. So that was one example. Now, um, another thing is the, which um, Mark Savish refers to in his book, is that egregores, the negative side of egregores. Now, if you think of that, the bubble, the skin of that bubble, as you're getting positive energy flowing into it, it's blowing up like a balloon and getting more and more energy in it. And it's all very positive. But when humans grow tired of pumping energy into it, uh, there's less energy there. How do you keep strengthening this egregore? And the answer is, unfortunately, that the best way of um, strengthening a tired old egregore is to invent an enemy. You see, when I mentioned the idea of the, the Nazi egregore. One of its greatest strengths was that it was anti-communist. Just as for a lot of people, the attraction of communism was that it was anti-fascist. So once you start sort of building up this skin on the principle, we must strengthen it because of the enemy outside, um, it changes the character, brings out the worst in egregore. Because, think of it like a cult. What happens when someone decides to leave that cult? Now, it may be because they're pissed off with the cult and they no longer believe in it. But it might also be something quite practical, simply that they've got family commitments, they've got a job to do and things like that, and they can't put all that energy into it. But what so often happens is the fact that they leave, they become condemned, they're damned, no one will speak to them, they're sent to Newcastle. It's um, uh, a very cruel treatment for people who were once very supportive and once were friends. So um, Mark Stavish in his book talks quite a bit about how one can detach oneself from egregore to break out safely because it's a powerful thing. It's very difficult to do. And in a, um, I think in a future talk, I'd like to look at one or two cults and how they can hold people in and why it's so difficult to leave. It's a real wrench if you've got a lot invested in that egregore to pull yourself out. Well, when I was talking about uh, my Abraham Lin experience and some of the lessons I learned, I talked about an exercise which I which I developed, which I called peeling off labels. And it goes like this. How would the media describe me? Lionel Snell, Ramsey Jukes, um, a 73-year-old English man, educated, six foot tall, etc., 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 now, each of those is a label. I'm 74. Okay, does that define me? A year ago, I was 73. 40 years ago, I was 34. Um, but I was the same person in many ways. A lot of me is there the same. So, I can detach from that label. I can peel it off. And there's still me here. I'm educated Okay, if I hadn't been educated, would I not have been me? I would be quite different, but um, I'm a curious person. I've probably educated myself quite a bit. So, um, although that's a strong label, uh, it isn't entirely me. And I take that off, and there's a lot of me left. I'm English, but I've been living in South Africa now for nearly 20 years, and um, I, I could take on South African nationality. Would I stop being me? No. You see, I describe this as peeling off labels, which actually wasn't quite true, because in fact what I'm doing is detaching from labels, because I'm still 74, I'm still English, I'm still educated, and so on and so forth. Um, but... I, I'm not 
wedded to those labels. Now, the reason that this is a good thing to do, I argued, is because each of those labels connects you to an egregore where you can be manipulated. So, for instance, I'm educated. So someone, an orator or a writer, who begins his speech by saying, of course, as every educated person knows, blah, 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 blah. Whereas the ignorant masses seem to think that, blah, 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 blah. That person is trying to get me on their side. You know, as an educated person, yeah, yeah, he's right, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, wow, there's ignorant people out there. God, they're, they're stupid, are they? God, blimey. Um, now, uh, as having detached from that label, if I heard that person speaking, I'd be less inclined to immediately align with him. I would listen to what he was actually saying. Critically, you know, yeah, do I think that? Ignorant people think that, do they? I haven't noticed that. You know, it'd be much harder for that person to win me over because I've sort of detached from that egregore. Now, if um, you're totally identified with being English, then you get these people who begin their speeches saying something like this. I'm sorry, I'm not one of those people who's ashamed to call myself British. Um, now, why are they saying that? Why is the guy apologising for something that he apparently seems to be proud of? Um, now, it's a trick, you see. When he says, I'm sorry that I um, am not ashamed to call myself British, why would he apologise? It because it suggests out there there's this huge majority of people all desperately ashamed of being British. You know, um, sort of, I'm ashamed of British, I'm ashamed of being British. Um, and that he's a little lonely man making a stand against it. Now, if I'm not ashamed of being British, I'd say, I'm on his side, you know, and, and then the rest of the speech, he can manipulate me into saying all sorts of things. Whereas, um, having detached from that label, I can think to myself, what I'm just thinking now, you know, why is he apologizing for having an idea which I think a lot of other people do? I know there may be some people who absolutely would say they're ashamed of being British, but the fact is, most people, it's very qualified. You know, are you ashamed of being British? Well, I, I thought what we did in the Falklands War was disgraceful, but generally I think we've done a lot for the world. That's the sort of answer you get. Um, but he is suggesting that out there there's this great mass we've got to defend ourselves against. This is the evil outside, this little bubble he's creating of um, let's be proud to be British or whatever. So, um, although... These are smaller examples than the, the big examples given by Mark Stavish, where he talks about pulling out of um, pulling out of an occult group or a cult or something like that. Uh, I suggest that this exercise I talk about, about um, detaching from all those labels that society uses to define you, is actually a very good practice for not being trapped in egregores. You get used to the thing that even the things that you think you identify with strongly, when you really look inside yourself and say, is that me? You realize it isn't. There's more to you than that. And so, so that really was um, what I wanted to do. Say, I tended to avoid terms like egregore as jargon for my own reasons, but I found this was a useful one and it's quite useful to look back at a couple of things I've talked about in previous things in terms of egregores to explain them from that point of view. And I do think I would like to um, do one uh, talk about um, cults um, in particular because I think they're very interesting. And um, there's a couple of, there's a recent example that I wanted to refer to. <laughs>